Edward, welcome to the show. So glad to have you join us today, and I'm delighted that you've made the time. I want to start off with asking you to, just to give the audience a little bit of a background um, about yourself and what it is that you do now and how you've how that has helped you do what you do today. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Big by pleasure. background, uh, by background, I'm a physicist and computer engineer, and I worked in high tech at every level from individual technical contributor to senior vice president for 30 years. For a big chunk of that time, my hobby was writing science fiction. After I sold my second novel back in 04, which meant the first one wasn't a fluke, I decided it was time for a completely new second career, and I've been writing full-time ever since, mostly science fiction. That is amazing. So did you, did you would you say that your background has given you a bit of a leg up in terms of writing sci-fi? Um, does it influence the way that you develop your storylines? Certainly, there's uh, a big influence. Uh, there's some science fiction which is just using science and technology as colorful background. There's other science fiction where uh, speculations about where science and technology might go are more central to the story. I write the second kind, and that certainly does tap my background. So, for example, I was a NASA contractor for seven years. That uh, gave me an awful lot of very useful material to use in my stories. And where did your where did your love for writing first start? You know, I'm always curious to know how authors got started. Who in fact the teacher school was it your parents, or did you just naturally love writing? It came to me kind of late. I've always loved reading. Writing's another matter. Uh, I got a, a master's in business administration at night after I was uh, working full time. And for years, I had virtually no time to read. Once I finished the program and started reading again, apparently I was being too critical about what I was reading because my wife said, so I suppose you could do better. Really, I had no choice then. And it worked out. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, how did you get to, um, to co-author books like someone with Larry Niven? I mean, that must have been quite... Uh, quite huge. How did you get to know him and how did you get to collaborate with him? We were at a World Science Fiction Convention together in 2004 on a panel uh, whose topic was uh, My Favorite Planet. The idea of the panel was each of us would uh, say something about what world, real or imaginary, we'd most like to visit or know more about. When my turn came, uh, I brought up something called the Fleet of Worlds, which is what it sounds like. It's a bunch of planets flying through space without a star. We get a brief glimpse of the Fleet of Worlds in Larry Niven's most famous book, the novel Ring World. So I told Larry he needed to write more about the setting because he'd only given us this glimpse. He said he didn't have an idea for that story. So shortly after I got home from the convention, I contacted him and said, well, I do have an idea for that story. And that led to one book called The Fleet of Worlds, which did well enough uh, to lead to a sequel. And ultimately, it's a five-book series. That is amazing. I mean, that to me just goes to show that if you don't, if you don't ask, you will never get an answer. And I think sometimes we hold back from asking because we think, you know, I'm I'm not of the same stature as this person. I could never do it. Um, 
but there's nothing wrong in asking. You won't know until you ask. So well, well, I'll, well done. I'll admit that uh, when he was interested in pursuing it, I was mildly surprised, but of course happy. And uh, it all worked out. Wonderful. Have you done any other book collabs since then? I have not done other collaborations, no. There have been occasional discussions, but for one reason or another, one party or another decided uh, they weren't excited enough to proceed. Uh, quite often when the, the offer has come in, uh, I've been so deeply immersed in something I was doing solo that I didn't want to set it aside. And I, I think that's happened in the other direction too. Yeah, no, I'm I'm sure. So, so your two most recent books were Trooping the Light, Fantastic the Science Behind the Fiction. Um, I'm guessing that in that one you applied a lot of your knowledge. Is that is that right? Is that fair to say? It's certainly fair. So, in literature, a trope is words used other than literally, which could be as simple as a simile, you know, gone like the crease in ten dollar pants. Um, it could be as complicated as repurposing an entire medieval civilization as the basis of a fantasy novel. In science fiction, a trope is science used other than literally. So science fiction often deals with uh, hand wavium like faster than light travel or time travel, which we don't know how to do and don't necessarily think are even possible. So the premise of the nonfiction book, Troping the Light Fantastic, The Science Behind the Fiction, is to look at these popular science fiction tropes, see how they've been used in science fiction, and look at real science, which offers us hope that these things might turn out to be possible later on. And uh, there are possibilities, somewhat speculative, but possibilities for uh, getting around what seems to be the restriction on faster than light travel. There seem to be ways with uh, lots of serious restrictions how time travel uh, could be possible, you know, other than going to the future at one second per second. Uh, looking at uh, suspended animation and general. Uh, artificial intelligence, you know, really smart AIs, not just smart enough to mock us with their uh, misunderstandings. So I had a lot of fun uh, doing troping, and I looked at something like a dozen different popular tropes. Awesome. So the book that we want to focus on today is Deja Doomed. Um, give me a little bit of background into the, the title of the book and um and and the story okay and uh i even brought my visual aid here's deja doomed i quite like the cover art it's beautiful yes i can take no credit for it the artist <laughs> uh, is awesome so deja doomed is a near future adventure set on the moon in this prospective near future, uh, the United States, China, Russia, and some private companies all have uh, modest uh, but growing presences on the moon. And uh, one of the groups stumbles upon uh, evidence of aliens having visited the moon in the distant past. So naturally, uh, Everyone wants to find out what's there and what the uh, what technology might have been left behind. Uh, you, you have to realize that uh, if aliens got to the moon, they came from far away. They have very advanced technology, and uh, perhaps nothing good's going to come of poking around in ancient alien technology. The, uh, the title Deja Doomed is a hint to the fact that uh, once some of that technology is awakened, 
uh, things don't necessarily go well. You know the trope in horror movies, uh, if, if someone goes alone into the basement, it's not going to go well for them. Well, when you poke around with ancient alien artifacts and you don't know what they're supposed to do, uh, it's probably not going to go well for you. That's not to say this is a horror story. It's very much science fiction, and it very much pays attention to how science and technology should work, even though it speculates about the technology that could bring the aliens to us. I lost audio. So even though you have that speculative side of... Um of sci-fi, you are able, because of your knowledge, to add a different dimension to sci-fi that um, a traditional sci-fi author wouldn't have. So I think it kind of, do you, do you think you have a bit of an unfair advantage almost? But that, that's what makes your books different um, and great. And that speaks, I think that speaks volumes about the awards that you've, and nominations that you've received for your work uh, so far, because you add, you have the ability, um, because of your background, to add a different uh, dimension. Well, that's certainly true to some extent. I won't claim to be the only science fiction author with a science or technology background. There are quite a few of us out there. But uh, like I said earlier, uh, it, it's not everyone. Sometimes the science is just background color. Uh, one of my favorite movies is called Outland, and it's um, basically um, high noon set on a, a moon of Jupiter. So it uh, uses science for color, but uh, you, you didn't need to know any science, and the authors didn't know any science for producing this great movie. That's not the kind of stuff I write. I like to think that beyond entertainment. Uh, when people read my stories, they come away appreciating that science and technology are good things and they're helpful for solving problems. Do you, do you write for a specific um, age group? I write for an adult audience. I mean, there's nothing in my writing that would be inappropriate for younger people, but um, I think before, say, middle of high school, it uh, probably wouldn't call out to them. I do want to ask you that, you know, things have changed significantly since you've been an author so, for so many years. And um, Deja, your book, Deja Doomed, was released um, during the pandemic. How was the marketing of that book different for you? The marketing was virtually all online. So I've done an awful lot of interviews like this, video casts, podcasts, uh, sometimes text interviews, and very little in person. So that's something of a change, but I think it's the way the world is going anyway. It's uh, certainly convenient. and. Uh, I think I like it, although uh, I would like to do uh, the occasional uh, book signing or, or, yeah. or go to conventions more so than uh, than I am. Yeah. Someday so the pandemic will pass. It will. It will. This too, I always say this too shall pass. So tell us a little bit about you. You mentioned just very briefly about the cover of your book. How did the, how did the design of the cover come about? Well, it's a, a fairly typical thing that I think we've just briefly um, lost the connection there. Second so stage. Us... There's a second stage discovery in the book. Uh, where some other technology is discovered deep in a lot. 
And so what we're seeing in the cover, and I'll hold it up again, is uh, our intrepid lunar explorers inside the lava tube. You can see Earth in the background in the opening of the lava tube. Seeing this incredible discovery, which leads to a second stage adventure where uh, the life of everything and everyone is at stake. So I was very happy that the artist uh, came up with, uh, with this cover and chose this scene out of the several I suggested. Awesome. Edward, can I ask you to read a section out of the book just to give audience a little bit of a glimpse of uh, what they can expect? Sure. I'm going to read a little bit from the first chapter. Uh, I think it's very atmospheric, sets the stage for this adventure on the moon. And uh, if I speak fast enough, uh, <laughs> we'll get to a cliffhanger. Thanks, Edward. Okay. Knife edged, as black as pitch, long shadows sprawled across the airless moonscape. In any shadow, unseen, dangers might lurk. Massive boulders, single and in jumbles, scattered rocky detritus, yawning fissures, concealed slopes, the treacherous crumbling rims of ancient craters. In shades of gray and brown and the occasional dark blue, the portions of the lunar surface not in shadow seemed almost as indistinct. All experienced in spectral translucence overlaid on mundane living room clutter. Even where the setting sun could still reach, temperatures had plummeted. Soon enough, only the crescent Earth's eerie blue light would shine here. A few more minutes, Ethan Nyquist told himself. To lunar east, an open expanse beckoned. Beyond the elongated silhouette of his, of his rover, its solar panels tipped backward and vertical to catch the day's final rays. That gentle slope seemed entirely sunlit, seemed entirely featureless. Almost certainly that ordinary looking plane held and hid its share of perils. From the rover's perspective, every rock, crater, rim, and rift to the east masked its own shadow. Naturally, his path led to the east. He had followed as best he could the hints of a trace of precious iridium, a hard, dense, corrosion-resistant metal with an ultra-high melting point. New industrial uses for the stuff kept appearing, and it was far scarcer than gold. He had followed the trail, in truth more of a dotted line, for more than a hundred miles, for six grueling days. For all the sensor readings he had collected along the way across the powdery lunar regolith, not one sample had begun to approach exploitable concentrations. It would be nice to know, before the onset of the two-week-long lunar night, whether, in his most recent detour, skirting a nameless half-mile-wide crater with sides too steep to enter, he had lost the trail. Because if he could find the source of the, of the traces, if there was a source, if the meteorite that had brought the iridium had not vaporized on impact, dissipating the rare metal in a gaseous cloud far and wide across the moonscape, he would become rich, very rich. That hope was all that got him out of bed most mornings. He had time to take another sample, perhaps two, before everything spread out before him was plunged into darkness. No atmosphere meant no twilight, the scant illumination given off by the crescent earth being no substitute for the setting sun. A wireless remote control module, little bigger, but more sophisticated and much securer from hacking than a game controller, sat on the end of Ethan's messy coffee table. Through that module, with smart specs and a touch feedback glove, he guided the prospecting rover, almost a quarter million miles distant, across the moon. 
until the sun fell beneath the horizon, rendering solar cell arrays useless. Until his rover went into standby mode, its critical components kept from freezing by a trickle of battery power. He was a robot wrangler, a damned good one. The job required attention to detail, fast reflexes, and superb eye-hand coordination while making no demands on one's feet. And that was fortunate because Ethan no longer had feet. Not unless you counted the little better than peg leg crap that the Veterans Administration called prosthetics, and he didn't. Not since the cafe bombing in Baluchistan or whatever that godforsaken corner of the world had taken to calling itself. This week. Ironic to get himself blown up, given that his army job at the time had been plotting robotic drones to blow up the bad guys. Ethan dragged his thoughts back to the task at hand. Iron, found in sufficient quantities, had value. Irony, like dwelling on the past, was a waste of time. And just then, at least in his least section of the lunar surface, from which the sun was about to vanish, he had no time to waste. Forward one-third, he intoned, gesturing above the control. On his specs, three seconds later, the vista began to change. Creeping up the shallow slope, angling mostly north to south and back again to avoid both the worst of the glare and the rover's own elongated shadow, an emerald green flash caught his attention. With the curl of his fingers, he turned right. There! A fist-sized rock sparkled with green. Halt! The rover glided to a stop. Engage the arm, he ordered. Three seconds after painstakingly extending his gloved hand, Ethan's specs showed the robot's telescoping appendage reaching out. Its mechanical gripper, mim mimicking his gestures, opened, then closed to grasp the green rock. Inside the fingertips of his glove, faster and faster, tiny pads vibrated. As with great care, he took hold of the rock. It felt like a rock. He turned and flexed his wrist and fancied he heard the whir of distant motors, examining the image in his specs. Up close to the camera, in any event, he held in his hand an agglomeration of angular fragments of shattered stone, held together by more stone, melted and recongealed. The green sparkles came from bits of volcanic glass, also embedded in the mass. In geologist speak, he held an impact melt breccia. Had it formed under the crash of a meteorite or from the debris almost as destructive splattered by a meteorite? How long ago had the impact happened? And as one meteorite after another had reshaped this barren landscape, how far had this particular rock bounced and rolled? He couldn't answer any of those questions, nor did he much care. But he did know, and was reminded of every instant he spent prospecting, was the was that this dead world surface was everywhere pockmarked from tiny dimples to craters a couple hundred miles across. The rock he held was in every respect ordinary. Ethan made a fist, the glove's fingertips madly vibrating to represent the force he exerted through the distant gripper. Rock shattered, gravel and dust drifted in slow motion to the distant barren ground. Mineral scan, he ordered, as his radio command at his radio command, the rover x-rayed the ground. Within seconds, its instruments interpreted the reflections. Readouts appeared on his specs. Silicon, of course. The lunar crust was rife with silicates. Iron, titanium, calcium, oxygen. He scrolled as quickly as he dared until iridium at last made its appearance in the list. A hair over two parts per billion. Not terrific, but twice the average in the Earth's crust thousands of times the lunar average. He had not lost the trail. Digits in a corner of his specs announced the sun would disappear in another 11 minutes. The drooping output from the rover's solar power unit implied much the same. Pan left, he ordered, and the distant camera pivoted. He wondered if he could squeeze in one last traverse across the slope. The scene on the specs swept past a cluster of boulders, slumped and pitted weathered by the endless hail of micrometeorites and the day-night temperature swings that exceeded 400 degrees. His point of view slid past the boulders. 
past the surface ripples like an old-fashioned washboard, with each ridge casting its own inky shadow, past the rover's own tread marks, past the scattering of pea gravel, past a crater less than two feet across, its rim edge still crisp, past. Something nagged at him, something out of the ordinary. The merest suggestion of color? Perhaps. Back by the rock jumble? Pan right, slow, Ethan ordered. His visual survey reversed. The little crater, gravel, tread marks, the stone washboard. And in a natural alcove, the sheltered space between two massive stone slabs that leaned one against the other, where a few rays of the setting sun managed to sneak through, he saw reddish-orange. On this drab world, the color alone was extraordinary. And so much orange. The blush peeked through a film of dust formed in the slower-than-glacial weathering of the rocks overhead. Full opacity, Ethan ordered. The living room backdrop faded from his specs. The distant image brightened. The orange-tinged mound, whatever it was, was big, eight feet or more in length from end to end, perhaps four feet wide at its broadest, up to two feet tall in spots. He tried to attribute a shape, but this thing defied geometry. A central mass with five projections of varying lengths. And from the shortest projection through the dusk came a golden reflection. A reflection? Beyond out of place, Ethan had no idea, no intuition even, what the orange object beneath the film of dusk could be. With the wave of a hand, he edged closer. The object's shiny end had a gentle cylindrical curve to it. Slowly, gently, he started to brush aside the coating of dust. Love pads conveyed to his fingers only the slightest hint of vibration. Still, at his feather light touch, the whatever it was crumpled into a fine powder and collapsed into itself. But not before Ethan glimpsed through the dissolving visor a mummified, an utterly inhuman face. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Edward. And um, I'm sure that's given listeners a great insight into your book, Deja Doomed. Edward, thank you so, so much. Just very briefly, we're out of time. What's next for you? Well, my next book up is called On the Shoals of Space Time. It's about basically a, an interstellar starship uh, with a bunch of alien tourists whose uh, ship suffers a terrible accident. They're stranded on the edge of the solar system, and their only hope for survival, if they can reach Earth or Earth can reach them, is for us primitive humans to help them. Awesome. Thank you. I want to say thank you so much for making time to spend uh, a few minutes with us and also a huge big thanks to our audience. You're watching the Writer's Corner live show. It's been a water cooler for authors since July 2018. Remember to write good stuff and we'll see you on the next episode of the Writer's Corner live show. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.